how can you see this picture right here, this the still of the video, and not be curious what he's going to talk about, what he is talking about. With that being said, hello, welcome back, and today I'm going to be watching and reacting to Why Are There No Bridges in East London? This is a great question, because when I was there, I definitely noticed that. I don't really even remember a bridge, maybe a bridge past the, the Tower Bridge, but really there's nothing, whereas everything west, tons of bridges. You just look down the Thames and there's just multiple bridges that you could see. That's really neat because there's multiple bridges for vehicles, of course. There's pedestrian bridges. You see bikers everywhere. It's, it's beautiful. Here in the U.S., I feel like there's not really, you know, they, they don't just make a pedestrian bridge. They figure, hey, since we're spending so much money, let's just make cars and pedestrians. So this will answer all of our questions, or hopefully you just learn something about why there are no bridges in East London, some history, perhaps if they're trying to make bridges in East London, why aren't there in the first place? Because London is massive. I don't know why there would be no bridges to this day in East London. Ooh. I had to turn on the fan. The fan is on, it's way too hot in here. So without further ado, let's jump into it. This is Jay Foreman, the YouTube channel, or guy. Jay Foreman, right here, Jay Foreman. Hit it, Jay. In West London, you're spoilt for choice for ways to cross the River Thames. But in East London, the Thames is your wet nemesis. Your only options to cross are queue for ages for the Blackwall Tunnel, go the huge long way round and pay the toll for the Dartford Crossing, or get seasick on the so slow it's <laughs> literally never worth it Woolwich Ferry. <laughs> This gives poor East... Has anyone ever been on that ferry? Because, yeah, ferries are really slow, and it seems like the the crew never really care to speed things up. You know, it's, it's, it's amusing. London, quite the disadvantage. Despite the very short distance as the crow flies, if you live here, it's very unlikely you go to work or school or do your shopping or visit friends here, unless you're a crow. Greater London effectively operates like a Pac-Man with a wacka wacka wide gap between these isolated communities. So how did London end up so unfairly asymmetrical? In other words, why is West London better than East London? Dun, 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 dun. Basically, there are three reasons why it's easier to build bridges in West London than East London. One, geography. In the West, the River Thames is a narrow squiggly trickle where bridge building is easy. But by the time it gets to London Bridge, it becomes a wide, majestic estuary with massive tides and marshy floodplains. Lest we forget, the Romans built London Bridge where they did, specifically because it was the widest place they could build it. 2. Shipping In the late 19th century, when London did most of its growing, it was the biggest shipping port in the world, making bridge building east of the ports practically impossible. The literally only bridge in East-ish London, Tower Bridge, was an incredible feat of construction, so impressive it merited its own episode. Its elaborate brute force engineering and massive cost were justified by its iconic location, a huge gateway to the heart of London for those yes. arriving by boat. Yes. So that answers my question already, and I was kind of correct. It's been, I mean, four years now since I've been to London, but I do remember that. I also had, really random, I had the option to go up in the Tower Bridge, and I chose. I was so beat. I was coming back from, from the White Tower, Tower of London, and I just chose. <sighs> we have so many other things. Let's, let's skip this for now, and when we come back, we can go up and uh, cross. I don't know how exciting it is up there, but um, yeah, you guys could... Um, Tell me how wrong I was, or maybe it was fine. Maybe it's fine if I miss it. Sorry. If they wanted to build any more bridges in East London, every one of them would have to be bigger or more complicated than Tower Bridge. And that wasn't going to happen because three, no demand. Historically, oh. East London has always been poorer and more sparsely populated than West London, with no rich people to pay tolls and no important people to complain. So not only was it more effort to build crossings here, it wasn't worth the effort. However, that all started to change at the end of the 19th century. In the decades since the disastrous Thames Tunnel, the Victorians had learnt some lessons and had become rather good at digging. Having figured out how to build miles of railways underground, all they had to do was exactly the same thing under the river. So at the end of the 19th Naturally. century, using the same technology as the Tube, London got its very first road tunnels, one at Blackwall and one at Rotherhithe. With demand, st <coughs> with demand still rising <laughs> and East London's Wait, population still growing, the little quips and tiny little things that you won't pick up on just watching it once are hilarious. I want to go back to read these. Oh no, my face is in the way. Fun fact, both tunnels were built in the shape of S bins to prevent horses from bolting when they saw daylight. That's the first one since so it's cut off. So that was a fun fact. This is a true fact. No, they weren't. So um, taking out that first fun fact. That's a myth. 
They are S-shaped because the approach roads don't perfectly line up with the straight bit under the river. With demand, st <coughs> with demand still rising and East London's population still growing, these should have, <coughs> should have been the start of a tunnel revolution spreading eastwards along the Thames throughout the, <coughs> throughout the 20th century. <coughs> so why didn't that happen? It's a story that's been told so many times I'm getting bored of it now. Basically, the war. First the First World War and second the Second World War put a stop to all big public projects. And when the wars were over, the money had run out, and it never really came back. And so, the 20th century saw pretty much no new river crossings in London. Apart from the Greenwich and Woolwich foot tunnels, which don't really count because they're just foot tunnels, Chiswick and Twickenham bridges, both part of the same road, opened on the same day in 1933, a second oh, wow. Blackwall tunnel, which doesn't really count because it's just a widening of the first, and the Dartford tunnel, which became two Dartford tunnels, which became two Dartford tunnels, and the QE2 bridge, which also doesn't oh, really wow. count because it's in not London. London found itself frozen in this asymmetrical state for more than a century. Wow. This asymmetry gives the river a completely different character depending which side of London you're on. In the west, the river brings prosperity and flats with views and gastropubs and university boat races. But in the east, the river brings... Industry! That's probably where he's getting. I see all the shipping containers out. That would make sense. You know, you need these massive container ships. Where's container ships? I don't know how deep it is there. I did not go east of the Tower Bridge. I don't think at all. That's the furthest east I think I went in London. By the end of the 20th century, the shipping industry that prevented Aye. any crossings being built here in the first place had all but disappeared, leaving behind a string of oh. post-industrial literal dead ends, oh. largely untouched by regeneration oh. or your thoughts. The exception that proves the rule is Canary Wharf, which since the 80s has seen a rebirth as a business district full of c Has no one ever thought to try to do anything to fix this? Yes, they have, ages ago. In the 1970s, yeah. plans were afoot for a long-awaited pill to close Pac-Man's mouth, the boringly named the East London River Crossing. By this time, technology had moved on and bridges had once again overtaken tunnels as the more cost-effective way to get cars across a river. The bridge formed part of the notorious plans for new motorways in London called Ringways. Uh? On the north side, the roads were more than ready for the arrival of the new bridge. You can clearly see on satellite view how the north circular road gapes expectantly open wide, ready to send and receive cross-river traffic. But on the south side, it's not clear at all where the traffic was meant to go. Uh? The new bridge would have necessitated the construction of a huge eight-lane motorway, bulldozing mm. hundreds of households out of the way. The people of Plumstead were understandably unhappy when the bridge got approval in 1985, but their bacon was rescued by an unlikely saviour. Two years later, in 1987, oh. the government accidentally built an international airport right next door to the site of the new bridge, which added a maximum height restriction on top of the already restrictive minimum height restriction. With the bridge needing a complete wow. redesign, that meant going through the approval process all over again. And this time, it failed, and all thoughts of a crossing here were abandoned in 1993. Hmm but not for long. <laughs> in 2004, the Mayor of London, Ken Livingston, proposed an upgrade, or downgrade depending how you look at it, on the same site, the slightly betterly named Thames Gateway Bridge. Ken's bridge was going to be a local bridge for local people. Wow. There would be just four lanes instead of eight, two of which would be bus lanes, which had the potential of being turned into an extension for the DLR. You can see on satellite view that Ken's bridge got quite far in the planning stages too. Just north of Galleons Reach, there's a wide concrete flyover that stops mid-air where the connection to his new bridge Fun. was going to be. Environmentally speaking, it was a massive improvement on the monster from the 70s, but there was a major flaw in Ken's concept. A local bridge for local people was a very naive and completely impossible thing to enforce. Oh, I'm pleased with this one. Go away. Ken's bridge could only have been local if it were one of many crossings in East London, so that travellers had lots of options, just like how it is in West London. But with East London so far behind, the Thames Gateway Bridge on its own would unavoidably have drawn cars and lorries from all over London, yes. congesting and polluting the narrow residential streets of Plumstead, True. which in wow. many ways is worse than building a motorway through it. The Thames Gateway Bridge was indeed designed to be joined later by the Belvedere Bridge and Silvertown Tunnel, but the locals knew that these complementary crossings wouldn't realistically have come to the rescue for decades, if they ever came at all. For that <laughs> reason, the Thames Gateway Bridge was viewed as a cause of congestion, and for that reason, it had almost no support, politically or locally. And for that reason, when the next mayor of London, Boris Johnson, came along, he took the popular and simple decision to scrap it. It was a rather odd move for Boris, a man so famously fond of bridges. Perhaps he just didn't like it because it wasn't his idea. It's harder than ever to get big projects like bridges funded by the government and or approved by the locals. That's why all the bridges built this century have been quite a pedestrian affair. So far, we've had the Millennium Bridge, which when first opened... But that thing... 
Looks great. That's a really nice looking bridge. I did not go over it, but I wish I did. Struggle to take the weight of pedestrians, and the Emirates Airline, an expensive, overbranded cable car slash tourist non-attraction connecting nowhere to nowhere else, inexplicably featured on the tube map despite a grand total of regular users of four. A few more pedestrian-only bridges have also been planned and not built. At Canary Wharf, Wandsworth, Pimlico, and most high profile of all, the profoundly wow. unnecessary Garden Bridge, intended more for private parties and selfies than for travel, which cost 53 million pounds just to cancel. But these are tourist attractions at best and vanity projects at worst, and they're all in central London. They do nothing to address the fundamental packmanity of Greater London and are quite insulting to East Londoners. So now, 15 years after the Thames Gateway Bridge was cancelled, what's been put on the table to address this? The worst crossing ever proposed. Right next door wow. to the Blackwall Tunnel, right. but at a jaunty angle, is the very controversially proposed Silvertown Tunnel. It's a very odd choice of location, given that it's one of the few parts of East London that already has lots of river crossings, and it's an even odder choice of mode. The Silvertown Tunnel is for motor traffic only, with no pedestrians, cyclists or trains allowed. Its purpose is to reduce traffic in the Blackwall Tunnel, which we really should have learnt by now, in real life will encourage more car journeys than before and create more congestion in the whole Blackwall area. Public opinion is more anti-car than ever, which is why there's a massive campaign against the Silvertown Tunnel. And as for whether it'll ever be built, I don't know. It's a paradox. Pretty similar to here in the US. I feel like if something's proposed, some big plans, and it, even it gets approved and it passes all the stages, I feel like you hope to see it within the next decade. You hope to see some progress, at least within a couple of years. Seems like it, it's similar in at least London. Maybe they're very strict. I know here, LA, Big cities here are very strict, very, very strict. Whereas you know, out more in the suburbs, it's it's more relaxed. And so maybe that's the case. But yeah, sounds, sounds about right. East London desperately needs connections, but East London desperately also needs not to be ruined by pollution and congestion. So what on earth could be the solution? There's actually a rather brilliant one. Oh, all right. The two as yet unconnected East Londons are a great opportunity to create ambitious new non-car crossings for rail, trams, cycling, and walking. Ignoring today's demand for new roads and instead providing for journeys that don't exist yet may seem daft and will certainly cause frustration for the first few years, but when the only option to cross is a clean, green, sustainable one, people will take the clean, green, sustainable one in their thousands, and the positive effect will spread well beyond the banks of this river. For proof of how brilliantly this phenomenon works, come with me now to West London. In 2019, <laughs> nasty cracks were found in the pedestals of Hammersmith Bridge, and the local council abruptly closed it to all traffic after 100... Is this the bridge? I saw an article when the, you had the heat wave uh, in the UK, in fact, a lot of Europe, and hit London really hard and, you know, the, the UK in general. And I remember them doing something to this bridge. I think it was this bridge. Let me know if I'm correct to kind of combat the heat that was... They, they may have been putting stuff around it so the heat didn't hit it directly and expand it and just break this bridge. I don't know what it's made of. 32 years of service. Understandably, many local drivers complained, saying it would cause traffic jams. And it did at first, but then an interesting thing happened. When Hammersmith Bridge reopened in 2021, it assumed a new role as a quiet, pleasant and safe pedestrian and cycle bridge, which has encouraged more journeys by foot and by bike, reducing car journeys and traffic, not just in Hammersmith, but across West London. What That's Hammersmith great. shows us is that what we choose to build, or indeed choose to don't build, affects how we choose or don't choose to travel. And that's the way round it should be. The tide is shifting, pun massively intended, in the right direction, away from cars. The proposed Lower Thames Crossing, a scheme to fight cars with cars to try to take traffic out of the Dartford Tunnel, has been roundly rejected by locals. There's actually been rather a lot of progress for trains lately. No fewer than seven new rail crossings have appeared across the Thames in the last 25 years, and there are even more proposed for the future. There's a potential rail link to Thamesmead from the DLR or Overground, but probably not both. There's the Kennex Tram, a planned tram network around the riverside commuter towns in Kent and Essex linked by a tunnel, which is too far outside London to be taken seriously. And of course, the Elizabeth Line is going to open, oh, tomorrow. Yes. Well, it took three videos, but that's pretty much the whole history of the River Thames and how Londoners have crossed it from the Romans to the present day. I find it fascinating how much London's relationship with its river has changed over its long history. It's actually quite sad to think that what started out as a major highway in the lifeblood of London, saturated with boats of all different shapes and sizes, now spends most of its time sitting uselessly empty, a physical and mental barrier between North and South London. But will this trend, like so many others in London's evolving infrastructure, shift back the other way? Are there ways we could put our river to better use? The Thames Clippers are starting to transform from an expensive novelty tourist attraction into a reliable commuter service. 
Maybe they have a future as a no-nonsense integrated part of the city's transport network, like how it is in Sydney, hmm. or Brisbane, or Copenhagen, or San Francisco, or Zurich, or Hong Kong, or Amsterdam. <laughs> or maybe they'll go completely the other way and drain the River Thames and turn it into a park. It's not that far-fetched an idea. It's exactly what they did to the River Turia in Valencia in 1969, making the city safer from flooding and opening up acres of new green space. Oh, wow. What future technologies lie ahead in the next thousand years that could see our river once again becoming a major useful highway? The answer is coming in part four. Hey! As always, Jay Foreman, spot on. Very, very, very funny. And there's a lot of things in there, a lot of little things that'll hear noises or they'll pop something in the map or he'll, he'll mention something and I don't get it because I don't live there. So I bet if you live there, you were probably uh, understanding it or laughing a lot more. But I remember taking the river taxi. I don't know if that's what he was talking about, but the river taxi was really nice. It was really, really nice. Oh, there's a Skyway. Um, I don't know if I remember seeing this thing. Does anyone take this? Is this is this liked there? I, I feel like it's uh, could be an eyesore. Or maybe it's really fun. I don't really know. So what do you think? How it is? future plans. Do you think something will get approved eventually it's for 20 years from now? Something could uh, be put in. And about the pedestrian bridges and bikes, how are people liking those? Is there a general consensus with what people, kind of like the feel of what people want there? Or to leave it the same, don't touch it, add more pedestrian bridges, do something in the east, just anything, you know. I would like to know your opinions on that. But until next time, doesn't seem like there's any plans, really good plans for it right now that are official. But thank you for joining. Thank you for watching and have a fantastic rest of your day.